We are the exclusive channel, a body like Bruce. Eureka, voila, we have finally found it. The book, Bruce Lee, The Letters of the Dragon, after hearing that some letters were discovered, Linda Lee and Bruce Lee corresponding with actor friend Bob Baker doing requesting drugs cocaine etc we have read that Bob Baker used to supply cannabis or hashish you should smuggle it in from Thailand it was high grade stuff potentially dangerous because apparently it had this little bug on it and something else and it was really potent and when Bruce Lee went for a check out the doctor says you've got a body of an 18 year old but you got to stop using that type of cannabis or hash because it, it will kill you but Bruce Lee ignored it because that's the only thing he could use to calm him down because he was too active that's why he was nicknamed Can't Sit Still when he was younger. He'd be doing multi-tasking, right? Lifting a weight, playing with the kids, bouncing them off his stomach, uh, doing stretches and all that sort of stuff, reading the book all at the same time, supposedly. So we're going to have a look at this book to see if it actually does contain those particular letters. It might be in a book written by Matthew Polly or something like that. I'm not really sure. An anthology of Bruce Lee's correspondence with family, friends and fans, 1958 to 1973. Letters of the Dragon, edited by John Little. It's a dedication. Here's some information about Tuttle. They're probably the publisher or something like that. Dedication to the letter writers, to those among us who understand that while historians may concentrate on coronations and battles, it is to the letter writers that we must turn when we want to truly understand. Like the journals and private papers of the classic gossips and diaries, Pepe's, Boswell, St. Simon, the function of letters is to reveal to us the littleness underlying great events and to remind us that history once was real life. For it is in letters that history and biography meet to form the most intimate of all forms of literature. Some have said that the theatre is what literature does at night. If so, then letters are what the creators of such literature do and think in the evening of their thoughts. For it is there, in the darkened innermost recesses of one's mind, well behind the glare of superficiality and trivia, that our passions, desires and truest selves reside. G.K. Chesterton once described the mailbox as a sanctuary of human words, adding that a letter is one of a few of the few things left entirely romantic. For to be entirely romantic, a thing must be irrevocable. Finally, this book is for the person who understands the true significance of letters, who appreciates the fact that it is upon the page of personal correspondence that the true soul of a human being is revealed and preserved in a fashion that makes them always present, oblivious to the ravages of time. It is here that one finds empathy with what Heloise wrote to her beloved Abelard. What cannot letters inspire? They have souls. They can speak. They have in them all that force which expresses the transports of the heart. They have all the fire of our passions. They can raise them as much as the person themselves, as if the person themselves were present. They have the tenderness and the delicacy of speech, and sometimes even a boldness of expression beyond it. Letters were first invented for consoling such solitary wretches as myself. Having lost the substantial pleasures of seeing and possessing you, I shall in some measure compensate this loss by the satisfaction I shall find in your writing, there I shall read your most sacred thoughts, John Little and Linda Lee Cadwell. 
contents page, an index, acknowledgements, acknowledgements patterns by Linda Lee Caldwell, introduction by John Little, a chronology of Bruce Lee's life. Acknowledgements, preface, with every adversity comes a blessing, Bruce writes a letter to his friend and colleague June Rhee, it's a master of Taekwondo, the challenge is to be patient until the blessing manifests itself and then to have the wisdom to recognise that a blessing has been bestowed. The adversity that was a constant companion for most of the 15 years covered by these letters was simply lack of funds to cover the cost of long distance phone calls. Up until the last year or so of his life, Bruce was prodded by necessity to communicate his thoughts and emotions in writing, in letters to family, friends and associates, and what a blessing this had turned out to be. Instead of hazy recollections of conversations, we have a collection of artful writings by a man dedicated to honest self-expression. In his films, the world has seen Bruce Lee express himself through his martial arts. In this collection, we glimpse the private side of Bruce's eloquence as he bears his soul through the art of letter writing. I feel most fortunate to have been the recipient of many of Bruce's heartfelt expressions. A wave of nostalgia washes over me as I relive th through his letters the small bits of our everyday life together, punctuated by momentous destiny changing events. Bruce's letters reflect the course of family life, lots of little business, like who's taking care of the dog, what time does a flight arrive, interspersed with significant drama that shapes direction and growth the birth of a child, the death of a family member. Not so very different from most people's lives, except for one thing that is evident in these letters, patterns. Patterns. This is the most important thing to look for as you read Bruce's letters. What are the central themes that emerge from Bruce's artful expressions? Can you spot an idea emerging from Bruce's pen like a butterfly escaping a cocoon? Can you watch the idea spread its wings and take flight? Can you observe the idea, perhaps now in a new form, as it comes to rest on a higher rung of the ladder of human maturation? An intelligent plan, implementation, realisation. This was Bruce. This is how he made his dreams come true. In Bruce's own words, here is a sampling of the patterns or central ideas to look for in his letters. Kung Fu is part of my life. The art influences my formation of character and ideas. The goal of my planning and doing is to find the true meaning in life. Peace of mind. Never waste energy on worries or negative thoughts it is not what happens that is success or failure but what it does to the heart of man no man is defeated unless he is discouraged what i honestly value more than anything else is quality doing one's best in the manner of the responsibility and craftsmanship of a number one This diligently trained body plus a time tried realistic faith in knowing that I can. It is not what happens in our life that is important, it's how we react to what happens. This last statement has formed a credo in my own life, especially through times of unbearable sadness. Sometimes life is nice, sometimes it is not, but it is the way that we choose to react to the nice and the not so nice that ultimately determines our characters. One's life is mostly a matter of choice, the choices we make in response to what happens to us. Take note of Bruce's choices in his life and the process he employed to make those choices. Keep in mind that these letters represent only a snapshot of the underlying intelligence of the author. In conjunction with the essays, notes, conversations and interviews contained in other books in the Bruce Lee Library, the total picture of a 32-year-old highly evolved human being emerges. Life, if thou knowest how to use it, is long enough. The Roman philosopher Seneca once wrote, 
and there is no doubt that Bruce knew how best to use the short life he was granted, whether or not it was long enough is not in our power to determine. Linda Lee Caldwell, Bruce's ex-wife, his widow. Postscript. Bruce's native language was Cantonese. He began to study spoken and written English at age 12. There is a funny story about the first day Bruce attended a school where English was spoken. The students were asked to write their English names. Not understanding the assignment, Bruce looked at his neighbour's paper and wrote that boy's name. Throughout his life, Bruce thought primarily in Chinese. He even dreamed in Chinese. His grasp of English, however, was excellent. He made a deliberate study of conversational English, an emerging pattern of self-education, and his library includes numerous books on English idioms and expressions. Bruce's ability to write perfect grammatical English was unsurpassed. He once wrote a paper for me in my freshman year of college because I was getting behind in my assignments, a direct result of being distracted by Bruce. You will not always read perfect grammatical English in his letters because even though he knew the proper rules better than most native speakers of English, he did not always take the time to construct perfect sentences in casual correspondence. Bruce's thoughts and emotions spilled out onto the paper as in Chinese his mind flowed as naturally as the waterfall tumbles over the precipice. I will give you my heart, please don't give me your head only, Bruce Lee. Absorb Bruce's letters through the walls of your heart, not through the mental process of your head. Linda Lee Caldwell, Bruce's widow. Introduction. You are holding in your hands the literary equivalent of Bruce's, Bruce Lee's private photo album. Each and every one of these letters represents a snapshot of events and occurrences that were taking place in his life at the moment. He recorded them. As such, each letter represents a historical milestone in the life of one of the 20th century's most charismatic and fascinating human beings. This book will allow you to be by Lee's side as he steps onto the boat that will bring him back to America for the first time since he was born there 18 years earlier. You will learn of his plan, his ambitions and dreams practical dreams as he would call them, which ones he actually willed to completion and which ones he allowed to pass from existence. You will be by his side as he begins to introduce to America the then unknown martial art of Kung Fu. You will share the deep philosophic wisdom and counselling he offered to gentlemen like Taki Kimura, his most trusted friend and his assistant instructor at his first formal martial arts school in Seattle, Washington. You will witness Lee at his most creative as he begins to unveil plans to develop his own unique and revolutionary martial arts system, sowing the seeds of what would become his martial masterpiece of human freedom and personal expression, Chi Kung Do. You will also be by his side as success begins to beckon when in the mid-1960s he is given the role of Kato in the short-lived Green Hornet TV series. You will also learn of his dignity and grace under pressure when this TV series was cancelled and Hollywood virtually turned its back on this passionate young man of destiny. You will not see him wallowing in self-pity, but instead keeping busy trying to cheer up his friends, such as Taekwondo master Jun Ri and students such as Larry Hartzell. You will also be pretty privy to highly personal correspondence between Bruce and his wife Linda throughout the most challenging periods in his life. You will witness the pain of his separation from his family, his love for and soul deep pride in his children, his delight in finally being able to provide for his family's future, his disillusionment with the jet set of the late 1960s, and his feelings, friendships and experiences with celebrities such as Roman Polanski, James Coburn and Steve McQueen. Perhaps above all, you will see firsthand how his dedication to quality and self-improvement resulted in his first appearance in the leading role, instantly establishing him as the most exciting film actor of his era, and how the heads of Western Studios, who only months before had condemned him as unbankable in North America, were now flying across the Pacific Ocean to persuade him 
to star in the North American feature films. You will also experience Bruce Lee in his pensive, quiet and reflective moments. Writing letters to friends and business associates, he soulfully expresses his wish that humans act humanely, that they be real, honest and genuine in their dealings with other human beings. And sadly, you will share his last thoughts and hopes, written in what would prove to be his final letter, a letter that is both tragic in its unfulfillment and ironic in its promise, which he wrote to his friend and attorney, Adrian Marshall, only hours before his death. These are the letters of a great man who accomplished many great things and made a difference in this world. They prove that Bruce Lee made full use of the 32 years of life that destiny granted him. They are presented in chronological order in hope that they may both move and enlighten you in a manner befitting the way he moved and enlightened all who were fortunate enough to know him. These letters reveal that his life epitomised the noble ethos of refusing to accept anything less than his personal best. His life embodied a personal philosophy of daily improvement, of cultivated greatness, of decency, of the recognition of the value of interpersonal relationships, of overcoming adversity and of the glorious triumph of the human spirit. Finally, Bruce Lee's letters reflect a life dedicated to the ideals of love, peace and brotherhood, which fittingly happens to be the heartfelt phrase with which he so often concluded his letters, John Little. A chronology of Bruce Lee's life, from when he was born and so forth. Up until his death. Discovering America, 1958 to... 1963 he's holding hands there with somebody not too sure who that is nineteen fifty eight to an unknown advisor a letter to an unknown friend April 29, 1959. First friend I met after boarding the ship turned out to be an Indian person. We had a nice time chatting. He asked me to teach him cha cha. After speaking for a while, he bumped into one of his friends, so I ended up alone by myself. So I returned to her room. In this room, I met with an elderly gentleman, Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke is a frequent traveller on these boats, and he offered some pointers which I appreciated. I also met my school friend's older brother, Mr. Chang. We basically did everything together. We went in and out activities and so on together. This person studies toilet foot boxing and has a definite interest and admiration for Wing Chun. We even came to agree to sightsee together in Japan. When you go to the bar for drinks, even Coca-Cola costs money. To me, I'd rather drink faucet water or tap water. The funniest of all is when I went to shower, I didn't know that I could adjust the cold and hot water, so I only turned on the hot and it got hotter and hotter as I was showering until I couldn't take it anymore. Then I turned it all the way to the cold water until I froze, until I got frozen. Later on when I went to the room, someone instructed me. I understood that there was a middle setting. After I got a bed, I felt my whole bed swaying. Very uncomfortable. I hope it won't make me seasick. Right now it is 11.30pm. I think I'd better sleep early because tomorrow's breakfast is at 8.30am. Uh, Open the door, this is Monday, May 4th, 1959. Open the door and you see the mountain. The problem with the above statement is that if you try to be too direct, things don't turn out properly and it always backfires. The mouth says yes, but the heart says no. Today is Monday the 4th, as the boat arrived to the shore, Peter, it's one of his brothers, came to receive him. Thanks to him, he took me on the train from Osaka directly to Tokyo for sightseeing. He talks extensively about that. And he had to possibly take some seasickness pills. Most of my dining companions couldn't make it up to the upper deck 
Donnie, you're today the band on board asked me to teach cha-cha. After I taught for 15 minutes, they came at a life-saving demonstration. Everybody has to go below on deck and put on their life jackets. This is very bothersome. Bothersome. To Melvin Dong upon Bruce Lee's arrival in San Francisco. Melvin, the boat arrived in Honolulu. I'm very disappointed to find out that you guys have not dared to write to me. Later, in the midst of not knowing what to do, suddenly a fellow passenger carrying a pitcher came looking for me, saying, Someone is waiting for you down below the deck. By the time I got to the gate, I noticed the lady and a gentleman waiting for me. One of them was called Older Sister, and the other was called Little Older Brother. Both were sent by the Chinese club troop to come and meet me. Meet with me. They took me around to many places, sightseeing. Later on, we ran to two people, Chang Ki Ming and Chi Lai Chung. According to the two people, Chi Lai Chung had a has a weird temper but after I met them he loved talking with me very much I know nothing about him other than that he told me he has collected thousands upon thousands of LP records I resorted to saying that in Hong Kong I also listened to a lot of albums he also complained of his own shortcoming of being hard to get along with and how his mistress had sold his Shatter vacation house etc then he proceeded to ask about the well-being of Papa or his father. He said that in the future he would return to Hong Kong to give, given the opportunity. But this individual does not trust anybody at all. He handles all his business personally. Why would he ever leave the whole business behind for someone else to manage? That evening they also introduced me to a Mr. Tang. This Mr. Tang person is very wealthy. He and I hit it off right away like we'd known each other forever. He studied Hong style boxing and loves the national art. He envies my skill and knowledge of Wing Chun and hopes that I can stay longer in Hawaii to teach him boxing and to find a school for me to teach it. And so forth. To Hawkins Chung in Kowloon, Hong Kong. I think he, this was a practitioner of uh, Wing Chun maybe. Posted from Seattle, Washington, May 16th, 1960. Dear Hawkins, I see that I am in your bad books through negligence and writing to you and do not know how to apologize sufficiently for the neglect. First of all, Hawkins, I must thank you for your welcome letter. Hawkins, I am really truly sorry about your sickness, but please do listen to me. It's no use to become nervous and fidgety. Remember that it won't help but just de improve the illness. Um, Hawkins, I hope you'll be better soon. Meanwhile, Take it easy. I admit that it's good to practice Wing Chun. To be perfectly frank, I practice quite a lot on it nowadays. The wooden dummy has been shipped to me from Hong Kong already. But as for you, I advise you to quit it for the time being and wait till you get better. So yeah, he must have been a fellow Wing Chun practitioner. Probably William Chung's brother or relation or something like that. Not too sure. I didn't do much for my spare time except study and practice and practicing Wing Chun for good of course. Now and then a South American would come and teach me some of his terrific fancy steps and have mine in return. The steps are really wonderful and exotic and how cute it is. I tell you what Hawkins when you get well I'll do my best and draw the steps on a piece of paper and teach you. Must be some sort of dance. Latino dance. And to a dear young lady To Diane, to Ed Hart, apologising he didn't write sooner as he was busy. Again to Ed Hart, and then to Pearl So, or Pearl So. Um, Was there anything romantic in that? One part of my life is Kung Fu. This art influences me greatly in the formation of my character and ideas. I practice Kung Fu as a physical culture, a form of mental training, a method of self-defense, and a way of life. Kung Fu is the best of all martial art. Yet the Chinese derivatives of Judo and Karate, which are only basics of Kung Fu are flourishing all over the US. 
This so happens because no one has heard of the supreme art, also there are no competent instructions. instructors. I believe my long years of practice back up my title to become the first instructor of this movement. There are yet long years ahead of me to polish my techniques and character. My aim, therefore, is to establish a first Kung Fu Institute that will later spread out all over the US. I have set a time limit of 10 to 15 years to complete the whole project. So there's some examples there of what Bruce Lee did. Uh, what he said himself, he gave himself a time limit okay, to achieve all of that. And he continues. saying right now or at that time he could project his thoughts into the future he could see ahead of himself he dreamed remember that practical dreamers never quit and he doesn't really own anything at the moment I'm not easily discouraged readily visualise myself as overcoming obstacles winning out over setbacks achieving impossible objectives whether it is the Godhead or not, I feel this great force, this untapped power, this dynamic something within me, this feeling defies description, and there is no experience with which the feeling may be compared. It is something like a strong emotion mixed with faith, but a lot stronger. All in all, the goal of my planning and doing is to find the true meaning of life, in life, peace of mind. I know that the sum of all possessions I mentioned does not necessarily add up to peace of mind. However, it can be if I devote my energy to real accomplishment of self rather than neurotic combat. In order to achieve this peace of mind, the teaching of detachment of Taoism and Zen proved to be valuable. Probably people will say I'm too conscious of success. Well, I am not. You see, my will to do springs from the knowledge that I can do. I'm only being natural, for there is no fear or doubt inside my mind. Pearl, success comes to those who become success conscious. If you don't aim at an object, how the heck on earth do you think you can get it? Warm regards, Bruce. So there's some more suggestives there that you could use to achieve all that you want, you desire in life. 1963 to Linda. Yeah. It's one day he hasn't written any words to the Japanese girl, Samba, or Sanbo, that he first had his eyes on. Okay. And he writes, 1963, to Linda, October 20, 1963, to the Swedish girl from the man who appreciates her. Linda, to live content with small means, to seek elegance, etc., etc., And some notes. So, so, so family and Bruce Lee's family were close friends when Bruce lived in Hong Kong during the 1950s and they remained friends throughout his life. Mrs. So Pearl's mother was like a second mother to him and he often sought her advice. In fact, he wrote her frequently to inform her of his progress in America. The two friends exchanged letters and postcards, some of which were brief and aphoristic, while others such as the letter reprinted here were much more soulful and in-depth. Linda is Linda Emery, who would become Bruce Lee's wife on August 17, 1964. This letter was written just five days before their first official date, which as she recalls, took place on October 25th, 1963. And he writes to someone called Fred. Using a typewriter, but it looks it. Uh, what does it say? Dear Fred, it might be a surprise, but instead of writing you from Hong Kong, I am writing from Los Angeles. You see, Batman is such a hit, though I kind of think it's silly that the Green Hornet is sold without a pilot and script. In other words, the series will definitely be up this coming season, which 
is this coming September and so forth. He'll be playing Kato. Doesn't sound like a Chinaman, does it? This right hand man of the Green Hornet instead of is that carrying all kinds of weapons. This fellow is to Kung Fu all his opponents and so forth. At present, he was taking, at that time, he was taking acting lessons. He's giving private lessons in Kung Fu. Among, among his prospective students were Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, can't really read that name, Vic somebody, Tommy Sands. It won't be bad, at least he'll be having pocket money at $25 an hour to the shooting two months away, etc. From Kung Fu to Green Hornet, 1964 to 1966. To Taki Kimura, his most trusted friend. There he is here. He was in a Japanese internment camp after World War II, something like that. And he went through a lot of crap and Bruce Lee made him confident again. Etc. Etc. That's what Taki Kimura says in his writings, and then he's formulating a philosophy or a new martial art here or something. Um, he's talking about the martial arts. One who is at peace and is quiet, no sorrow or harm can enter. Therefore his inner power remains whole and his spirit intact. The nature of water is that if nothing is mixed with it, it remains clear. If nothing ruffles it, it remains smooth. Definition. 1. To be one thing and not to change is the climax of stillness. 2. To have nothing in one that resists is the climax of emptiness. 3. To remain detached from all outside things is the climax of fineness. Was that meant to be finesse? We we'll take it as it is, fineness. For to have in oneself no contraries is the climax of purity. No mind, no thought. Discard all thoughts of reward, all hopes of praise and fears of blame, all awareness of one's bodily self. And finally, closing the avenues of sense perception and let the spirit out as it will. The highest school operates on an unconscious level. Sincere thought means thought of concentration quiet awareness. The thought of a distracted mind cannot be sincere. Man's mind and his behaviour are one. His inner thought and outer expression cannot contradict each other. Therefore a man should set up his right principle and this right mind principle will influence his action. If you look within yourself and are sure that you have done right, what do you have to fear or worry about? You, are, you require only to perform your own mission in life without any thoughts of aggressiveness or competition. Follow the will of nature and coordinate your mind and your will to become one with nature and nature will protect you. Yielding. Yielding will overcome anything superior to itself. Its strength is boundless. The yielding will have a reposeful ease, soft as the downy feathers, soft as downy feathers, a quietude, a shrinking from action, an appearance of inability to do the heart is humble but this work is forceful and so forth and he writes to Bill Evans about some articles he explains the symbol in the, in the seal of the Jun Fai Kung Fu Institute which is a symbol of yin and yang in which the yin and yang black passive and white active are two interlocking halves of one whole so he's not saying that they are two separate Right, because night becomes day, or turns into day, or day turns into night. Right? You have male, female, and one complements the other, and so forth. They are mutually dependent and are a function each of the other. The 
complement each other. To William Shung, who is ACT Australia, he uh, fled apparently, he sort of triads after him, something like that. And he went on a boat, sailed down to Australia, and apparently he got attacked. He beat them all up, but he sat down and he didn't realise he had axe in his back. Yeah, so he went to Australia and established a wing. Chun school there, right? And now he's the Grand Master of Wing Chun, traditional. Okay, and here's another letter by Bruce said to him because in Hong Kong, where the man was, this like one of his top students, Bruce Lee supposedly trained with him or under him, etc. And Taki Kimura, Brandon's born, July 1965 by the looks of it. Brandon Bruce Lee. A big healthy boy of course. Yeah. He writes to Taki Kimura, February 1965. He puts here, things are getting pretty good here in California and if I have not told you that I'm married, well I am. She's a real nice girl and is a straight A student. We have been married for a year, something now. In fact, we are going to have a baby soon. This book, the book you read is the basic book I've written somewhere in 1963, etc., etc. Okay. And there's a letter to Taki Kimura, speaking of his first child, Brandon Bruce Lee. Okay, he's writing to his wife Linda, posted from Kowloon, Hong Kong, February 16, 1965 at noon. Bruce Lee with his mother, Grace. Left, right, oh, it's his mother, right, and long time family friend, Eva So. Left Hong Kong around 1963. There's Eva there. It looks like his mother there. Bruce in between. Okay, he writes more to Linda. How's my son, Brandon? Next time, write and let me know. How he has changed in two. He's telling her, wish she was there. Must have missed it. Must have missed it heaps. Right. Keep writing more letters from Kaolu. Who looks like he wrote quite frequently. There they are in love. Yeah. A loving couple. More letters to Linda. Sataki Kimura, uh, May 10, 1965, and so forth. Did to James Yim Lee. Apparently, I'm not too sure if this is the one, this is a guy who eventually died of cancer or something like that. He, he got really, really sick. And Bruce, like, was totally uh, saddened by that. Pretty sure it was this guy. He had some sort of illness. But he died like in 1972, something like that. I can't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure that's right. What if this is the guy that was the engineer and he made all these um, fitness gears to Bruce's requirements? Bruce would draw them and stuff, and this guy would make them, and that improved his physical etc etc given that physique right it's fitness etc I'm pretty sure it's the same guy and he writes to James and tells him about his new discoveries in regards to the martial arts he writes to James again He gets this idea about protective gear. 
protective equipment is the most important invention in Kung Fu that will raise the standard of Kung Fu to unbelievable heights. In order for Kung Fu to remain supreme over the other systems, the protective equipment is a must. With the ability you have in making things, yeah, I wish have definitely him. I have confidence in your building the first practical protective equipment in the history of Kung Fu. Your work will be remembered. Kung Fu needs it. I've written to... Okay, that's to George Lee. I've written to James to tell him to help you in every way he can. If you need any help, call him. Start with this great plan at your earliest convenience and devote whatever time you have. This plan depends on you because knowing the rest of the guys, they do not have the incentive or the ability. Take care of yourself, my friend Bruce Lee. Okay, so this George Lee, uh, I don't know if he's a brother or related to J James Yim Lee, but they both got together and created these tools that he required for his training and stuff, right? And one of them is a grip machine, George Lee constructed based on the design Bruce Lee provided. So he drew it, designed it, etc., whatever, and he gave it to George, who then created it. To George Lee. Just got a letter to see how my favourite student is coming on. And then to Fred Sato. About Batman and the Green Hornet. Taki Kimura in April 18, 1966. To Fred Sato again. To George Lee. And then to William Dozier, the, uh, was he the creator or the director of the TV series Batman. Vicky, whoever that was, to George Lee, to Taki Kimura, there they are there. From left to right, George Lee, Ella Joe, Bruce Lee, and James Jim Lee. These two might not be related. Very popular name, Lee. There's the notes. There we go. Like Bruce Lee, William Chung was a study a student of Yip Man he was also Bruce's childhood friend. Okay, so they've known each other for quite a while. Um, Bruce had returned to Hong Kong in the summer of nineteen sixty three with one of his Kung Fu students, Doug Palmer. Fellow is Bruce's student, James Yim Lee. Immediately after they were married, Bruce and Linda moved in with him and lived with him for several months. James was the assistant instructor at Bruce's Jun Fan Kung Fu Institute in Oakland, California. And then he ref what the book he's referring to is his Chinese Kung Fu, The First Philosophical Art of Self Defense, which was self published in 1963. Taki Kimura laughs because he sent Bruce a letter and stated, I thought that I could impress Bruce if I signed off the letter in Chinese. I'm of Japanese persuasion myself, so I didn't know that much Chinese. For some reason though, I got Si Hing, your senior, one who learned before you, confused with Si Dai, your junior, one who learned after you. Fortunately, Bruce had a good sense of humor about it and realized that I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck or a smart ass but simply got my terms mixed up. I had a hard time living this one down though. Chi <laughs> Kundo in the Art of Cultivating Optimism, 1967 to 1970. And he's writing to George Lee, Tuesday, January 31st, 1967. about fluidity, emptiness, and so forth. And he's writing to George Lee again.
dear George, too bad you aren't here. You should have heard the comments from the fellows down here. Is he a pro artist? I don't believe this. Dan said that and many, many more on the fine work you've created. Maybe that's Dan is Oh Santos. Uh, as for me, they are terrific. Thanks once more for the many hours you put in. You are the greatest, Bruce. To George Lee in May and June, then to his wife Linda. More letters to Linda. Bruce with Lee with the Lee's great Dane Bo. Yeah, I think they had another dog. Oh no, someone else said a dog. They called it JKD. That's right. More letters to Linda. He got a part in Ironside starring Raymond Burr. Maybe he went for an addition there. He got it. Started making a bit of money. Oh, yeah, okay, he's right to Linda. Yeah, started making a bit of money. To George Lee, Taki Kimura. about economy of motion, fluidity, etc. Martial arts. Giving some examples here. This chart drafted by Bruce Lee and sent to Taki Kimura about 1967 explains the schematic of combat and features the five ways of attack of Jeet Kune Do. More correspondence with George and Taki. Again, to William Chung in nineteen sixty nine. By nineteen sixty seven, Bruce Lee had created a name for his own method of expressing himself through combat and. Chi Kung Do. He's been doing good at that time of acting. Got a few spots. And he bought himself a home. The latest one he was in at that time was an MGM production, Little Sister, with James Garner, that should be coming out in a few months. Yeah, he appears on TV and movies occasionally. And that in the 60s, late 60s. Writes to William Chung again, then to George and to Taekwondo Master Jun Gu Ri. Again to Jun Gu Ri. Bruce Lee included this poem which he wrote to help encourage his old friend, advising him not to let adverse circumstances affect him and to realise that each individual controls his own destiny. You are the master of, captain of your destiny, master of your fate, all that sort of stuff. Okay, who am I? And there's this poem there. Well, quite a long poem. He talks to him about negativeness. You have what it takes. I know you will win out one day, one way or the other. So damn the torpedo, full speed ahead. Remember what this Chinaman says. Circumstances, how I make circumstances. Peace and harmony, Bruce. So he is very uh, helpful. He had good advice. He cared. And he tried to pull his friends up by their bootstrings, by their socks, when they were down and doubting themselves. And okay, more letters to George Lee and Taekwondo Master 
Jukuri. To Su Hansan. Must be some sort of uncle. To Leo Fong. Here are some historical facts on the Choi Lei foot style. Remember that the tombs are mainly of Cantonese origin. They are difficult to obtain. Took him some time. And how where it was founded and who by. And then he writes in 1970 to Wang Shung Lung. To June Ri. The following letter was written by Bruce Lee to his friend June Ri with some ideas on how to produce a television show of self defense for women. Chung Gu. Here are some thoughts that went to my mind after our phone conversation. Background for program. Lessons. Some things to be considered. So forth. A handheld kicking and punching board made by George Lee after the design and suggestion of Bruce Lee. And he replies to George, a masterpiece indeed, my appreciation, my friend, not only to the workmanship that is always tops, but particularly to your thoughtfulness. Thank you, George. Peace, love, brotherhood, Bruce. Don't forget that was the 60s, late 60s, so that was all the hippie, you know talk and to William Chung in February 18, 1970 to Linda his wife continues writing to Linda and Brandon must have done him a picture. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah, there he is. Bruce and Brandon Lee prepared for their departure for Hong Kong in 1970. Maybe it's when they did that TV show and he broke forwards, something like that. Not really sure. He's talking about his sister Phoebe, his mother. <laughs> Brandon what Linda Brandon wants you wants to write you a poem again hooray hooray today is May and he did a picture by the looks of it sketches by Brandon with his captions inserted by Bruce this sheet was included with Bruce's April 3 1970 letter to Linda Hamilton Lee in Kowloon, Hong Kong. Not too sure who that person was. Probably not all, not even related, right? None of these guys are related to each other, probably. Lee's just a popular Chinese name, right? To George Lee. Thanking him for the immediate setting of the padding he asked him to make uh, from his drawing, probably. Yeah, Dan is probably Dan in San in Santa, who was not only Bruce's Bruce Lee's good friend, but who also assist, assistant instructor at his Los Angeles Chinatown School Martial Arts School room. And goes on about Ted Wong. Steve McQueen was in San Francisco filming the movie Bullet. The three United States Karate Freestyle Champs were Chuck Norris, Joe Lewis with, and Mike Stone. Yeah. Jun Ri, Jun Gu Ri is 
considered the father of Taekwondo in North America and was a close friend of Bruce Lee who appeared at many of Ree's martial arts tournaments in Washington DC and often wrote to encourage Ree in his many martial art related projects as we read and many others that he may have corresponded with According to Linda Lee Cadwell, whenever young Brandon wanted attention, he would run up to someone and excitedly say, Me, 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 me. <laughs> Mr. C and Mr. N were, I think that might be knee, were Cantonese film stars from Bruce's childhood. Bruce Lee hurt his lower back quite severely in 1970 with no steady work in Hollywood and his injury preventing him from practicing. Linda had to work evenings in order to help support the family. This of course distressed him even more as he felt it was his duty to provide for his family. He wrote this note one evening during this period. He was a very thoughtful man then. The star begins to rise, golden harvest, letter. To Mr. Ted Ashley, Warner Brothers Studios, Burbank, California, USA. 1971 to 1972 era. That looks like, yeah, I thought that was James Coburn. Uh, a break during the Indian scouting trip for the silent flute from left Silifant. It's probably on there. Lee, Bruce Lee. James Coburn and the guide. Three Americans being fitted by the Indian host far left Silifant. Um, not really sure that might be Silifant there. Or maybe it's in Centre. Uh, far left Silifant Centre, Bruce Lee. So it must be here. Far right Coburn. And then Larry Hartzell. With this letter, Bruce enclosed one of his favourite poems, which praises the power of positive thinking in the face of adversity. It was sent as a motivational tool to strengthen his friend's will to recover. So that. concludes possibly part one of this particular video we might do a part two you can uh, let us know in the comments below this video if that's something you'd want to see more of um, don't forget to subscribe to our channel give us a thumbs up a like and then go share this video with all your friends and neighbours family, friends and neighbours. We haven't found anything dirty, smutty or to do with drugs yet. That could be another book for all we know. Uh, or maybe it was in a bunch of files when certain people were allowed to go to his house after his death a certain person and rummaged through all his notes etc and found medical um, receipts all sorts of stuff and it looked like he was in debt uh, etc etc so we hope that you enjoyed this watch out for part two if there is one